When I go to pull a bottle or a vial of some organic compound off the shelf, should I expect it to be a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Well, that has everything to do with the physical properties of the compound, something we haven't set a ton about in explorations of molecular structure to date. That's going to change with this video, where we're going to connect molecular structure and intramolecular forces to the physical properties of organic compounds. And something I want to emphasize is that you already have the foundational knowledge and skills to do this from your introductory chemistry course. Everything you know about intermolecular forces from your introductory chemistry courses still applies to organic molecules. They're just a little bit bigger and a little more complicated than the molecules you've seen previously. But the exact same logic we've applied in the past to rationalize trends in melting points, boiling points, and other physical properties are going to apply to organic molecules just as well. And so in this video, we're going to make that connection between intramolecular forces and physical properties for organic molecules. Let's start by reminding ourselves what we mean by physical properties. A physical property is a property of a substance that pertains to a process that doesn't involve bonds being made or broken or a change in molecular structure. There's no change in molecular structure during a process associated with the physical property. So this might be a phase transition, for example, solid to liquid, liquid to gas. It might be dissolving in a solute or precipitating out of a solution, various things like this. And as we know from introductory chemistry, these physical properties are rooted in molecular structure via intermolecular forces. It's the interactions between molecules that give rise to physical properties. And those interactions, as we'll see on the next slide, are essentially electrostatic in nature, and we can classify them based on the nature of the electrical interaction that is essentially at their root. On this slide, I've given three examples of carbon-containing compounds in different states of matter. It makes the point that organic compounds may be solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature, depending on their molecular structures. Sodium acetate, for example, is a solid at room temperature, with a melting point way up at 324 degrees Celsius. Its boiling point, well, it has no boiling point, because liquid sodium acetate decomposes before the liquid boils and converts into a gas. Diethyl ether is a liquid at room temperature with a much lower melting point of negative 116 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 34.6 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of barely a liquid at room temperature. It's absolutely volatile. It will evaporate fairly quickly on its own at room temperature. And above the temperature of a reasonably warm day, it's going to boil. Chloromethane melts at negative 97 degrees Celsius, but is a gas at room temperature, boiling at the very low temperature of negative 23.7 degrees Celsius. So here we have solid, liquid, and gas, and an absolute downward trend in the melting and boiling points. What we want to be able to do is connect that downward trend to properties of the molecular structures of these compounds. What is it about sodium acetate that gives it such a high melting point? What is it about chloromethane that makes its melting and boiling points so low? We're going to do that in the remainder of this video, drawing on our understanding of intramolecular forces from introductory chemistry. So let's dive right into intermolecular forces and remind ourselves what's going on here. Intermolecular forces are electrostatic in nature. They're derived from attractions of opposite charges, positive and negative charges, between two or more molecules. And we can classify intermolecular forces according to the magnitude and permanence of the charge. There are forces that involve partial charges, and there are forces that involve full charges. There are forces that involve temporary charges, and there are those that involve permanent charges. And thinking in this sort of framework gives us a nice, well-organized way to think about the various possible types of intermolecular forces. I've listed them on this slide. And the first which is arguably not an intermolecular force, but fits in here nicely into our scheme because it involves full permanent charges, are ion-ion forces, or ionic bonds. These occur in ionic compounds, compounds involving bonding between a metal and a non-metal, typically. So something you've probably seen in your introductory chemistry course and in everyday life is sodium chloride. And of course, what we saw on the last slide, sodium acetate, which contains an ionic bond between the sodium cation and acetate anion, has ion-ion forces as well. So these compounds contain very, very strong, what we might call interparticle or interion interactions 
essentially ionic bonds. Intermolecular forces that do not involve these full permanent ionic charges are collectively known as van der Waals forces. And this term is sometimes misused um, to just refer to London dispersion forces, but in fact, all intermolecular forces between partial charges or involving a partial charge are collectively called van der Waals forces. Generally, the strongest of the van der Waals forces are hydrogen bonds. And this is a special type of dipole-dipole interaction involving most commonly an OH, NH, or FH bond, as well as a lone pair on oxygen or nitrogen. Speaking of dipole-dipole forces, these tend to be a little bit weaker than hydrogen bonds because of their lack of a covalent component. And these are just interactions between partial positive and negative charges in molecules with a permanent dipole. So we have permanent partial positive and permanent partial negative involved in dipole-dipole forces. And by the way, just to back up a little bit, hydrogen bonds are typical in alcohols, typical in amines, and other compounds that contain the OH and NH functionalities as well. Dipole-dipole forces you'll see show up in any compound with a pretty strong permanent dipole moment. Things like acetone, acetonitrile, groups like C double bond O, C triple bond N, things like this. London dispersion forces involve temporary partial charges as a result of random fluctuations of the electron clouds of molecules. And these are the dominant intermolecular forces in hydrocarbons. It explains why hydrocarbons like hexane and pentane are liquids at room temperature. They have strong enough London dispersion forces to remain in liquid form, basically hold their liquid form at room temperature. So hydrocarbons like CN, H2N plus 2, alkanes, that kind of thing, tend to have dispersion forces as the dominant intermolecular force, although these other types of compounds also exhibit dispersion forces. One that's important for mixtures is listed here, ion dipole forces. Ion dipole forces help explain, for example, why sodium chloride is soluble in water, since the polar molecule water with a permanent dipole moment can interact with the full positive charge of the sodium cation and the full negative charge of the chloride anion. So ion dipole forces are sometimes important in thinking about solubility. And as you probably recall from your introductory chemistry course, stronger intermolecular forces are associated with higher temperatures for phase transitions, higher melting point, higher boiling point. So if we back up to the previous slide, the strongest IMS are associated with sodium acetate. And indeed, what's going on here is arguably not even an intermolecular force, maybe an interionic force, ionic bonding. On the other side of the coin, the lowest boiling substance, at least chloromethane, has the weakest intermolecular forces. It is a polar compound for sure, but it's a smaller molecule than diethyl ether. It has weaker dispersion forces as a result, and chlorine being a little bit less electronegative than oxygen, we might argue that the IMS are going to be a little bit stronger in the more polarized diethyl ether. In thinking about intermolecular forces and physical properties, we can kind of group organic compounds into two classes, and also the groups within them into two classes, hydrophobic and hydrophilic molecules or groups. So the bottom of the slide makes the point that we can use these terms to refer to whole molecules, or actually more commonly, I would say, groups within molecules, regions that are hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilic means water-loving, right? And so hydrophilic substances are polar or ionic, things with significant partial or full positive or negative charges. The classic hydrophilic substance, which you could argue we could, we're being a little silly calling it hydrophilic, is water itself. Water is a polar compound, exhibits hydrogen bonding, all of that kind of stuff. Small alcohols are also hydrophilic, things like CH3OH, which are heavily polarized and able to hydrogen bond, able to strongly interact with water through intermolecular forces. And so among hydrophilic substances, we'll see as a big theme, hydrogen bonding. We'll also see permanent dipoles and a pretty strong permanent dipole so that we can get pretty strong dipole-dipole forces involved with hydrophilic substances. Or again, groups, heavily polarized groups within organic molecules can also be called hydrophilic. 
On the other side of the coin, we have the water-hating or hydrophobic substances, and these are nonpolar molecules that do not interact strongly with water and, and generally form, for example, entirely different layers or entirely different phases from an aqueous or, or water phase. And these are nonpolar compounds. And these are the hydrocarbons and other sort of oily nonpolar things that we're used to seeing in organic chemistry. Molecules like hexane, no letters to be seen in that Lewis structure, right? Carbons and hydrogens abound. Double and triple bonds don't really change the situation in these. So for example, one hexene is also a hydrophobic substance. We can also, again, talk about hydrophobic groups within a molecule. So to give you an example of this on the slide, fatty acids are these long chain molecules with a long hydrocarbon chain capped off with a carboxylic acid group. The carboxylic acid group, if we look at it in isolation, it's got the ability, the capacity to hydrogen bond. It's got an oxygen with two lone pairs involved in a double bond. It's got a second oxygen that's part of an OH group that can serve as a hydrogen bond donor. That thing would love to hydrogen bond. So that end of the molecule, we could argue, is hydrophilic. On the other hand, we have this huge greasy alkyl chain on the other side of the molecule, which of course lacks the ability to hydrogen bond. There's essentially no polarization of electrons on that side of the molecule. And so we could argue that side of the molecule is hydrophobic. We might say that overall the molecule could be called amphiphilic because it's hydrophilic on one side and hydrophobic on the other. And these molecules pop up in biochemistry on a regular basis. For example, the cell membrane includes phospholipids with a phosphate group that has negative charge, hydrophilic, and a long greasy chain of, of carbons and hydrogens that's hydrophobic. So you'll see these molecules again in your biochemistry courses.